Hello, my name is John Powell. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley and the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley. And I'm here today to talk to you about Othering and Belonging on behalf of Welcoming America. Now many of you may not have heard of the terms Othering and Belonging, but all of you will be familiar with the concept. So let's talk about the concept of othering and belonging and how it plays out in our society. Othering is basically a process where we deny someone full humanity. We deny that someone is equal to us and worthy of equal regard and respect. And there are different ways of othering people and different extremes. So let's talk about a few of them, many of which you will be familiar with. Think about the founding of our country. The English came to the, the shores and quickly othered Native Americans, calling them savages, running them off their land, and basically saying they were not as good as the English. Shortly thereafter, they brought over indentured servants and blacks from Africa. The indentured servants was considered less than the people who ruled the country and the Africans were essentially enslaved and took a permanent place of being outside of the political community. In fact, in the middle of the 19th century, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a position authored by Chief Justice Taney, made the observation that blacks were not people and could never be part of the political community, and that whites had the right to enslave blacks. That's profound othering. It's denying that people exist as, as human and denying that people exist as equal and justifying the enslavement of people. When slavery ended, blacks were still considered outside the political community. After a short period of time, the United States in its laws and practice adopted Jim Crow practices throughout the country. Up until the 1960s, there were water fountains for blacks and different water fountains for whites. In many towns, whites would close swimming pools rather than share swimming pools with blacks. It wasn't just blacks. When you think about women, until 1920, women were not full citizens of the United States. They were not given the right to vote. In many cases, they couldn't hold certain jobs. Then we look at the disability community. Again, until fairly recently, the United States justified sterilizing women so that they would not have disabled kids. We literally put people who are disabled in homes and sometimes just let them die. We have many examples today, sometimes as pernicious, sometimes not as pernicious. We're all familiar with what happened to Jews in Germany or what happened in Rwanda. So the othering process is, can be extreme. When we deeply other people, we don't see them as human. This is not just an idea. We can actually see this in the brain. Nature thought it would be pretty interesting and cool for us to recognize fellow humans. So when we see another human being, there's a part of the brain that lights up. It doesn't mean you're going to be friends with that person. It doesn't mean you like that person. It just means you recognize that person as another human being. When we deeply other people, that part of the brain does not light up. And instead, the part of the brain that lights up is associated with disgust. Today, there's been studies showing that in America, many people do not see homeless people as fully belonging, as human beings. And that part of the brain is associated with recognizing a human being does not light up when those people are seeing. Returning felons, returning citizens, also are oftentimes not seen as fully human. And the whole concept of undocumented aliens. So one of the things that's often associated with being othered is that we see the other not only less than us, but sometimes we see the other also as a threat. You notice I talked about women, disabled people, blacks, returning citizens, people can be othered in different ways. 
So for elderly people in our society, we oftentimes see them as less than, but we also have some degree of empathy in the form of pity. Our elderly uncle or aunt or mother, we don't see them as insects. We don't see them as deserving to be put in cages, but we don't see them as fully human either. So those are some of the ways in which we other. Sometimes othering is a very transitory expression. Someone comes to a party and they're poorly dressed or dressed out of uniform. They didn't get the memo. We may other them. But that othering does not continue and it does not stack up. But then there's some groups that we see as always other, no matter what they do or what circumstance they're in. Again, referring back to people who are unhoused. Right now, as I'm recording this, there's a spat of violence going around the country directed at Asians and Asian Americans. And it's clear that in terms of our history, we've maintained that even if Asians live here, they will never be really Americans. It's a way of othering them to say they don't fully belong. When we run across the problem of othering and try to resolve it, we sometimes move to what I call saming. Saming is basically saying, okay, they don't, they're not exactly like us, but they're close enough, and if they try hard and they become like us, then they can be part of the community. But my membership, or the membership that's afforded through saming, is predicated on someone proving they're just like us. We become the standard for what's human. Assimilation is a form of saming. And while saming is better than genocide and better than putting people in cages, it's still not enough to tolerate people or to say that people first have to become just like us is still saying first they have to lop off part of their humanity. One of my favorite writers is James Baldwin. When he was at the height of his literary career, he was asked if he wanted to join a famous literary organization. He was delighted. He'd been looking forward to for this for years. And in his excitement, he went to talk to them. And this is what they said to him. Mr. Baldwin, we are delighted to have you as part of this club, but a few things. We know you're gay. Can you not rub that in our face? And we know you have many friends who are riffraff. They're not really welcome here. And the riffraff, of course, meaning black people. Baldwin was brokenhearted. He didn't join the club. He left the country instead and wrote a book called The Price of the Ticket. And he said the price of joining, the cost of assimilation was too high. Many people from Eastern Europe or from Latin America, in order to, to, in order to join America, they changed some of their names, their habits, their eating, to try to assimilate. And of course, at some level, they can never really assimilate, nor should they have to. So, if the way to address othering is not saming, what is it? This takes us to belonging. Belonging is the solution for othering. Again, you may not have heard of the term. In fact, when we talk about diversity, we're more likely to talk about equity and inclusion. Well, belonging actually takes us further than inclusion. So let me give you an example. Let's assume I'm giving a party. One day this pandemic is gonna be over and that may actually happen and you're all invited. But notice, you're invited to my party. So in that invitation, you do not get to pick the guest list, the food, the music, the time the party starts and the time the party stops. I may have asked people to take off their shoes at the door. I may only have vegetarian food. The point is, is that you are a guest in my house. And as a guest, I get to make, as a guest, you do not get to make the rules. That's inclusion. So what is belonging? Belonging is where we give the party. So the people who are coming to the party are also given the party. A kind of potluck, if you will. We decide the food, we decide the guest list, we decide the rules. We co-create the party. 
So belonging at its heart is about co-creating. And we get to show up and collectively set rules. It doesn't mean it's a free fall, but it means we negotiate and talk about what rules we want to live by, what kind of party we want to have. In order to co-create, which is the heart of belonging, you need at least four things. You need agency, a sense of who you are as an individual and as a group. You need power. You need the capacity to actually affect change. And not power over others, but power with. You need to have care, love, and empathy. You need to be able to care for others, and not just your group. So when you create belonging, you're not creating belonging just for your group, but for all the members. And you need responsibility. In co-creating and giving a party, it becomes our party. We're all responsible. So how do we move to belonging? Belonging is hard work. It's aspirational. Maybe we'll never get there. There's one kind of belonging that we see where I create my group, but then I other your group. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about belonging where everyone is inside the circle of human concern. And not just people, but the planet itself. Now, some will say that's fictional. We can't do that. And, but not so fast. We've expanded the circle of human concern, not perfectly, but we've been on that journey for many years. And we're not done. So there's some techniques that can be used to expand the circle of human concern. First of all, let's go back to othering. Right now, othering is a big problem, not just in the United States, but in the world. Our country is deeply divided. The container that we all lived in is being challenged. There are cracks in the container. So it's not clear how we're going to land. What's driving this? Well, there are probably many things. But one of the things we do know is that people, and not just people, but Mammals can only process so much change in a short period of time before it's under stress, before it's anxious. And the change that we're living through right now is really happening at a rapid pace. What are some of those salient changes? So one is the change in technology. While we may think it's a good thing that every couple of years I got a new phone, it also produces stress. The change in technology, the change in the climate. We all live now with the threat of climate change. And it has an impact on our nervous system. And of course, there's change in the pandemic itself. We've been cooped up for a year, wondering what life will be like tomorrow. Wondering, is this the new normal? Or will we ever go back to normal? And a big one is change in demographics. When we see people interact with people who don't look like us, or even if they do, we don't think they're our group, it creates anxiety. What we do with that anxiety is a different question. So while the anxiety is natural, most mammals will experience anxiety dealing with rapid change in their environment, but that anxiety can move in one or two directions. It can become fearful. It can become laced with hate. It can become a practice of othering. That's called breaking. When we not only see people as different, but we see them as a threat. We see them as dangerous. We see them as need to be contained in some way. That's called breaking. The other alternative is that we see them as different than us, but also similar to us. We see new possibility, we see new worlds, we see new environments that we can cohabitate. We listen to each other's stories. We listen to each other's migration. We listen to each other's suffering. It doesn't mean we agree with them. It doesn't mean that they're right and we're wrong, but it means that we acknowledge there's something fundamental about them that we connect with. That's called bridging. And bridging in many ways is based on empathetic, and compassionate listening and practices that connect us to each other. 
So which of those stories will prevail? It's not clear. Leaders play an oversized role in deciding whether our stories are a bridging story or a breaking story. All of us are dealing with a certain degree of anxiety. And the anxiety is more than just about a job, more than just about our housing value. It's about who we are individually and collectively. And so we're watching tensions, not just between individuals, but also between groups. And most of the work dealing with bringing people together from Alpert in 1954 or from Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone, really is focused at the individual level. And what we're being challenged to deal right now, to do with right now, is deal with tensions and stresses at the group level, national level, or even institutional level. We can do this. We have to tell better stories, have better practices, and learn. So Welcoming America is one of those organizations, I believe, that stepped into this space to try to figure out how to create bridging stories in a new, larger, inclusive we where we all belong. I will say that as powerful as the work that this organization is doing, welcoming still has a tinge of power, uh, lack of symmetry. If I'm welcoming you, then I am the host and you are the guest. So we may have to nudge a little bit and move from welcoming to belonging and co-creation. Now, many of you may be wondering, okay, that's great to be done at a group level, uh, but what can I do at an individual level? And that's important. I'm going to say a few things about that, but also give you some resources. But also we have to think about it at the government level, how we make laws, how we make policies, Think about it at institutional levels. How are our institutions of work, our schools, uh, our companies, how are they structured to lean into belonging? How are they structured in terms of creating space where people can bridge and break? What are the stories and practices that they lift up? So what can you do as an individual? Well, first of all, you can become more familiar with these concepts and these practices. And you can actually think about what are you doing and is it bridging or breaking? Are you othering or practicing belonging? And small things like asking people how they are, and listening to people, turns out to be quite powerful. We just finished with an election and they found when people who engaged in something called deep canvassing, it had a powerful impact. So what is deep canvassing? Well, what it is, is where a canvasser in a one-on-one -on -one situation goes up to a house uh, and instead of saying vote for my candidate or here's my issue they start off by just saying how are you tell me about yourself how's your family what do you need what are your anxieties and aspirations they engage in deep listening they engage in compassionate listening and in doing so they found that people connect and it not only changed the person that's talking, it actually changed the canvasser as well. And those changes tend to stick. So there's something profoundly healing about being recognized. They've seen this in ch school children. That when school children are seen, when they're heard, when they know they're recognized, their performance in schools go up. So all of us can participate in learning to listen better. And also we can think about how our societies are structured how our neighborhoods, our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, how they're structured. It may feel a little awkward to engage in this practice initially because so much of our society is organized around breaking. The heart of breaking is a story about the other that's a threat, that the other is threatening our job, they're threatening our safety, they're threatening who we are. But there's another story, I think a better story, that we are building a larger we.